Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Ed. When Tammy was a kid, her and her sister would often use Ouija boards, and it always seemed that they would end up communicating with the same spirit who was named Ed. Ed apparently wasn't super nice because he would continually threaten their younger brother during this time, and he was never with them during the times that they were using the board, so it was definitely weird. Eventually, they got creeped out enough that they got rid of the board and just put Ed behind them. A few years later, when their little brother got older, he had used a Ouija board with his friend a couple of times, and he came home to tell his older sisters a story that had him freaked out. He explained that every time him and his friend used the board, there kept being a spirit named Ed who was threatening him. Apparently their mother ended up banning the use of Ouija boards in their house, which really is the right move. In our number 9 spot today we have the book. Okay, so what if I told you that someone out there really thought it was a good idea to write a book that is for children, but it tells them how to summon demons? I mean, listen, for years there's been urban legends like Bloody Mary and Charlie Charlie, which of course tell us instructions on how to summon those respective demons, but urban legends are part of being a child. It's spooky stories to share amongst friends, but this book really takes things to an entirely new level. Many who are more well versed in the worlds of witchcraft and the paranormal have explained that this book, written by Aaron Layton, is basically a grimoire. It contains 72 different demons that can be conjured by those who read it for their own personal gain, which is basically the definition of black magic. The book not only includes these sort of cute drawings of creepy demons, but it also includes the symbols for each demon, which some have warned is also a very bad sign. In our number 9 spot today we have The Room. This story comes from an anonymous source, but we'll call them Alex. Alex Alex and their fiance, who we'll call Sam, were given a Ouija board that their friend had apparently found on the side of the road, which I feel like is the worst place to find a new Ouija board. Alex and Sam decided to use it one night and began to ask questions. They asked who was with them and if they were an angel, demon, or spirit. It replied that their name was Mo and that they were a demon by your creation. Alex and Sam were obviously freaked out and just asked a few more simple questions, like what is your favorite poster of ours on the wall? Mo replied with bloody mess. Alex and Sam had a kiss photo with Gene Simmons on it that had blood everywhere on it. Alex pointed to that poster and asked, this one? Mo said yes. Alex and Sam had a few skeleton heads that sat on their TV, so they asked Mo to move the skeleton heads so that they could have proof Mo was real. Mo said to close their eyes, so they did. A few seconds later, all of the skulls on the TV had moved to be facing them. Only Sam and Alex were in the room at the time and they had been sitting right next to each other, which would have made it impossible for one of them to be pranking the other. In our number 7 spot today we have Niccolo Paganini. Niccolo was a professional violinist who was born in 1782. His parents began to send him to lessons when he was just 5 years old and by age 15 he was already touring the world because he was so talented. What's interesting about Niccolo and his story, other than his obvious musical genius however, is the rumors surrounding his talent and subsequent recognition. According to some, people People believe that his own mother summoned the devil in order for her son to be the extreme talent that he is. There are many modern diagnoses that could potentially explain some of what made Niccolo so talented, and I mean, we all know quite well that sometimes people are just born with extreme talent, but of course in the early 1800s people in their imagination certainly ran wild. The final reason why people believe he may have made a deal with the devil is because shortly before his death he was quite sick. The doctors had a feeling he was nearing death, so they sent in a priest to pray over him. When he first saw the priest, it is said that he freaked out and sent the priest away. Many people believe that him pushing the priest away was only a confirmation of the fact that he was working with the devil. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Lady Ghost Demon. This story comes from the Reddit user Seven Legs Spider, and they really just dive in. Basically, for several years, Spider saw what they thought was just a lady ghost every night at the door of the closet. It. it happened for so long that Spider just got used to it and even started saying goodnight to her. Spider says she didn't look bad or rotten, she was just a lady with pale skin and dark hair. Anyway, after a few years of this, Spider finally tells a friend at school about the lady. He of course didn't believe the story right away, but the next day at school he tells Spider that this lady tried to hurt him while he was sleeping. Now, Spider didn't believe the friend and thought he was just playing a prank. Some more time goes by and Spider decides to tell another friend about the lady, and the same same thing happens where the next time she comes and tells Spider that the lady had tried to hurt her while she was sleeping. The first friend and the second friend 
didn't know each other, so it's not like they could have been conspiring, which made Spider believe his first friend was telling the truth. Then, a while after that, Spider is on a video chat with a friend and they are talking about the paranormal when they both see something run across the screen. They chalk it up to being a glitch and Spider starts telling this friend about the lady and then Spider begins to get extremely dizzy like they're about to pass out. After it goes away, Spider tells their friend that they're okay and the friend replies that they were out of it for at least a full minute and that he could feel that someone was there trying to hurt Spider. I'm In the end, I'm just really glad that Spider and all of the friends ended up being okay and I really hope they found a way to get rid of that demon lady. In our number 5 spot today we have the meditation. This story comes from someone online who starts off by explaining that they accidentally summoned a demon once and it was a huge mistake. They say that it all started when they were meditating with some stones that a friend had given them. They say that the stones were polished and given to them in a medicine bag. When they went to meditate they were holding four in each hand just letting their mind wander when they felt something or someone slam into their back. After this they heard demonic laughter and a bunch of banging upstairs when there shouldn't have been anyone up there. They immediately blew out their candle and left the house. When they returned to the house later they explained that this is when they started to see shadow crawlers all over the walls. The strange occurrences continued as they would hear the sound of children laughing in their home despite no children being there and things would suddenly disappear only to be found later in places that had already been checked. They finished this story by saying that they ended up fleeing the house one night night and burning it down, never to look back. I'm gonna be honest, not sure about the whole burning the house down thing. Seems maybe a little illegal, but I guess all is fair in the world of demonology. In our number 4 spot today we have Zozo. This story comes from the reddit user Archaic Alchemy who we'll call A. When A was 22 they were staying with their sister and one night they had a couple good friends over to hang out and play around with a Ouija board which is always the start of a good demon story. A had read about people encountering an entity called Zozo and A really just wanted some proof that things exist beyond our physical realm so they really wanted to use the Ouija board. Everyone places their hand on the planche and A calls out to Zozo. It took a few attempts before anything happened, but then the planchette began to move in figure eights. No matter what was asked, it just kept moving in this pattern until it finally spelled out M-A-M-A. A kept asking who they were talking to and eventually they spelled out Zozo and then things really escalated. The planchette was taken to the letters to spell out kill you and when A asked who they spelled out one of the friends names. They didn't take it seriously and kept asking more questions and one friend made the mistake of insulting Zozo. The planchette begins frantically moving through the alphabet backwards over and over before it stops. Then the energy in the room completely drops and A knows that this means that Zozo has manifested itself. Suddenly A begins to laugh maniacally with no control over it. A could feel Zozo's presence inside and could feel Zozo turning all of this hatred and anger towards the friend that had been named before. A's emotions suddenly completely switched and they began crying uncontrollably before again suddenly snapping back to anger. A's head turns involuntarily to look at the friend with a menacing grin as A pushes the planchette towards this friend. The friends decide it's rightfully time to leave and shortly after they left, A felt like they regained control again and Zozo's presence had disappeared. I'm very glad that nothing even crazier happened and that Zozo wasn't able to end up harming this friend in the end. In our number 3 spot today we have Giuseppe Tartini. Okay, so this story is one that is kind of similar to Nicolo's but even more strange. Giuseppe was an Italian violinist and composer who lived during the 1700s. He went on to compose a song called The Devil's Trill Sonata and not only um and not only this, but he also claimed to wake up one night to find Satan sitting on the edge of his bed playing the violin. Seems as though the devil really likes violins, apparently. What's extremely curious is that after this alleged encounter, it is said that Giuseppe's violin skills hit heights never seen before. He was able to suddenly play extremely complicated trills that are impossible for most musicians. Apparently even today the sonata is too difficult for many musicians to play, which is why people believe that perhaps this story really was true. In our number 2 spot today we have the grey skin demon. This story comes from Pink Magic 
chick 724 on Reddit, and it is about a night that they had a few years ago while still in college. Pink Magic's best friend of many years was in town, so they went out for a dinner to catch up and spend some time together. They of course ended up getting a bit caught up, as best friends do, and before they know it it's around 2am and definitely time for them to head home. Pink Magic's friend was the one who drove, so they headed off to Pink Magic's house. They're at an intersection waiting for the light to turn green when Pink Magic turns their head and looks out the window into the car next to them. This is when she sees the person next to them is looking directly back at them, but this person has grey skin, completely black eyes with no white, and they're smiling but their teeth are long and sharp. Whoever or whatever this thing is will not break eye contact. Pink Magic tries to scream, but no sound will come out. I've had that nightmare before. And eventually, the friend sees this creature too and immediately speeds out of there. To this day, neither of them like to talk about it, and neither of them are quite sure what exactly they witnessed. In our number one spot today, we have Johann George Faust. According to the stories passed down about this man, it is said that he was an alchemist and astrologer who lived in Germany during the 1500s. It is said that in his plight to become the smartest man in the world while also enjoying as many earthly pleasures as possible, he summoned the help of a demon named Mephistopheles. I thought that that was just one of the cats from Cats, but apparently not. Anyways, there are terrible stories about how cruel and truly evil this man was, and as a professor, it is said he looked down on everyone else because he thought he was smarter than them. Local priests apparently believed that he had actually made a deal with the devil, and that his his pet dog was actually a demon who was able to shapeshift. What's most interesting about this is that during his life, he did publish several grimoires, and in 1540, while conducting some sort of alchemaic experiment, his laboratory exploded. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Theophilus of Adena. Okay, so to start off this list today, we are taking it a little bit back all the way to 538 AD. Theophilus of Adena was a cleric in the Roman Catholic Church. So basically, one day he was elected to become the new bishop, but he ended up denying the offer as it is said that he wanted a more priestly sort of position instead of one with all of that power and responsibility. It is said that he wanted the position of archdeacon, which would have seen him controlling where the donation money went. So apparently, in passing on this bishop position, he thought that if he gave this bishop position to his rival, then his rival should at least be grateful enough to give him the position he wanted. But of course, that did not happen. The new bishop gave away the seat that Theo wanted and instead gave him the position of being a humble cleric. This made Theo super angry, and this is when he thought that maybe the church isn't as holy as he once thought they were. This is when he decided to summon the help of Satan. He ended up signing a contract with Satan in his own blood. He denounced Jesus and the Virgin Mary, and it is said that, with the help of Satan, he was once again voted into the bishop position, and this time he accepted. At this point in time, it is said that he felt so guilty he confessed to this deal with the devil, and the priest who he confessed to decided that they should burn the blood signed contract. For a second, Theo looked up, but then suddenly he collapsed and died. Many people believe that it was because he had broken his contract with Satan. In our number nine spot today, we have Woken Up. This story comes from someone named Justin, and one night Justin and some friends decided to try their hand at contacting the spirit world through a Ouija board. They began to ask questions, but instead of the planchette moving to certain letters, it began to move to all four corners of the board, making a sort of X before it just started to go in circles. Justin and his friends decided to call it a night with the board, but not too long after this day, Justin decided to try again with a different friend. The planchette began to move in strange patterns again, but this time Justin said it felt like some sort of hex. Later that night, as he was sleeping, he all of a sudden out of nowhere felt some sort of forceful hand grab his arm, which of course jolted him awake. Once awake, he couldn't see anyone or anything around him, and everyone in his house was peacefully asleep. In our number 8 spot today, we have Aleister Crowley. This man is quite well known for being the leader of an occult group, and this really does stem back even into his childhood. It is said that quite early on, Aleister started calling himself the Beast and the Antichrist, and he is even quoted as saying that God and Satan fought over his soul. In one of his books, he wrote, quote, I was in the death struggle with self. God and Satan fought for my soul, those three long hours. God conquered. Now I have only one doubt left. Which of the twain? 
slain was God. Many people believe that perhaps he made a deal with Satan, but it is possible that these are just rumblings based on Alistair's teachings and beliefs. In our number 7 spot today we have The Basement. This story comes from someone named Vince and it has to do with a time he played with a Ouija board. He didn't really expect much to happen and was just sort of going along with it, but during the time using the board, the lights began to flicker and the air around Vince and his friends got quite cold. This is when they knew that something more serious was going on. The demon began to communicate with them through the board and it told them its name, which Vince says seems like a sort of Russian name. When they asked how the dark spirit got there, they explained that they had been killed. Vince explains that he and his friends took a break from the board, but they didn't remember to close the circle before they left, which if you're not familiar with Ouija boards, is a huge mistake. Once they all returned back to the basement where they left the board, they could feel the heavy energy in the room, and they came to find that everything was in complete disarray. Books were thrown about, things were sprawled on the floor, but the only thing that hadn't been touched was the board, which still sat perfectly still in the center of the room, just how they had left it. Victor ends his story by saying, quote, Upon looking at a mirror that we had nearby, the eye of the Ouija board was moving sporadically in its reflection. In our Number six spot today, we have the text. Okay, so this story isn't like others on this list, and it's one of the strangest I've ever heard. So basically, this person who was, you know, on a dating app receives a text message one day from one of the guys that they were talking to that says, quote, I've been thinking about summoning Satan to impress you. Okay, personally, I would run the other way, but turns out these are texts some people are just waiting around to receive. When they followed up the text, the person said again, quote, No, I'm not kidding, unless I told you when I was drunk, I legitimately sold my soul to him in January 2013. Turns out this guy really meant it. Of course, this person needed to know more, and as it turns out, they got the full story. So basically, this guy explained the entire procedure of selling your soul. He said that it's simple, you just have to write a letter, sign it in your blood, perform a sort of ritual, and then some sort of physical mark will show up on your body, like a scratch, and according to this guy, your wish has just come true. Apparently after this guy had done all of that, he said that he laughed in a voice that wasn't his own, and since then, all of his desires have been coming true. This story is weird, but apparently it really is that easy. Definitely wouldn't recommend trying it though, just in case, you know? In our number 5 spot today we have The Entity. This story starts off hot when the storyteller explains that they have used a Ouija board and since doing so, they clearly have opened their home up to some sort of evil entity who hasn't exactly been kind. They say, quote, it started out with that feeling like you're being watched and doors are closing and you hear footsteps on the hardwood when you're home alone, and it progressed slowly into being kept awake by something shaking the bed or pulling off your covers, sometimes even whispering your name. The board would disappear for days on end, then show up in places you never would have put it. I became obsessed with it. Then it was a black mass in the corner of the room or the silhouette of a man watching you from the doorway. After that, it escalated pretty quickly. I had my hair pulled, fingers pricked, scratched. They go on to explain that sometimes while they're trying to sleep, they find themselves unable to move and can feel the entity whispering in their ear in what they say is Latin. They explain that they have since had their house blessed and are hoping that this keeps the demon at bay. In our number 4 spot today we have Jack Parsons. Jack was a man who was born just a few years prior to the Wright brothers flying the first airplane and being born at a time like that had him growing up dreaming of and reading sci-fi novels about rocket ships taking people to space. It is said that this love of rocket ships and these dreams of going to space are what led to him summoning the devil in order to make a deal. Jack wanted to sell his soul in exchange for a rocket ship. Ship. This deal didn't end up working, but Jack continued to study science as he grew older. Later in his life, he stumbled upon the teachings of Aleister Crowley that we talked about before, and this is when he tried his hand at summoning things again. This time, he tried to summon a goddess named Babylon that was said to possibly help men get to the moon one day. Technically, in some ways, it worked because Jack Parsons ended up helping create the jet fuel that is said to still be used today. Maybe it was the deal with the devil, maybe it was the goddess, or maybe it was just good old passion and drive that did it. I guess it all depends on what you believe. In our number 3 spot today we have The Mistake. This story starts off with the storyteller and their wife and this new home that they had moved into. They both noticed some weird things happening around the house and this led to them getting a Ouija board in the hopes that maybe they could get some answers as to what 
may be happening here. What they didn't realize before using the board, which is pretty common, is that these boards open the door to communication for anyone. Anything lurking on the other end can answer the call, and sometimes it's not the spirit you're hoping for. While using the board, they ended up contacting some sort of entity that didn't give them very clear answers, and things were feeling kind of vague. Near the end of their Ouija experience, they had the planchette just suddenly fly off the board, despite neither of them touching it. After this experience, however, things got so bad that the pair had to break their lease and move. They explained that there were radios and TVs turning on by themselves all the time, they would find taps running when no one had left them like that, they could hear disembodied voices around their home, objects were moving, and the storyteller's wife even said that she had found the storyteller possessed one night. But. He has no memory of it. In our number two spot today, we have the artist. Back in 1677, an artist named Christoph Heisman was working on a castle in Austria. He was so talented at his job that he had been commissioned by the nobles to do this work. There were rumblings about how he may have sold his soul to the devil, but no one was sure of it until it is said that Christoph confessed. He said he had nine years prior and that he regretted it very much now and actually wanted an exorcism. They demanded to know if he was a practicing witch, but in the end, it was decided that he was not, and that instead the devil just had a very strong hold on him. The local priest began giving Christoph exorcisms, and during these sessions, Christoph explained that he had these intense visions where he was coming face to face with the devil who was in the form of a dragon. The dragon was holding the contract that held Christoph's soul, and this is when he was able to rip it out of the dragon's talons. When he woke up, it seemed as though he was cured. After this, he began painting pictures of the devil, and he even painted a story with multiple panels that told the story of how he sold his soul and how they helped him get it back. In our number one spot today, we have This Is Not A Game. This story is said to have taken place over a decade ago, and it starts off when the storyteller's sister had some friends over and they were in the basement watching a scary movie when they decided to start playing around with the Ouija board. Things weren't going exactly as they anticipated, and they all started getting frustrated at the board and began to hurl some insults toward it, calling it fake and things like that. At this point, they turned their attention back to the movie and away from the board, but it soon became clear that someone was in fact listening. All of a sudden the lights and all of the electricity goes out and it's just pitch black. The TV suddenly turns back on, but it's just blaring static. The TV shuts off again and turns back on, but it's just a black screen. Suddenly words appear on the screen that reads, this is not a game anymore. They all ran out of the house as quickly as they could and that was definitely the last time any of them touched a Ouija board. It isn't exactly clear who or what they summoned, but whatever it was, it certainly was not playing around. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Dreams. This is a story from somebody named Jake P, and they wrote, quote, My buddy and I found a Ouija board at my girlfriend's house. We were really bored, so we went to this graveyard by my house to see if it would actually work. As suspected, nothing happened. We brought the board back to my house and didn't think anything of it. I feel like that's like the classic story. Just when the Ouija board hears you talking smack. That's when things always start to go crazy though. Jake continues on saying, quote, The next day, strange things began happening. Out of nowhere, my friend started having sleep paralysis every time he spent the night at my house, despite never having it before. The first time he saw a tall woman with long black hair standing in the corner of the room facing the wall. The next time he was asleep on the couch and he saw the same woman standing at my open door looking directly into my room. I don't know what demon lady they summoned, but I hope they did everything they could to get rid of her. Sounds an awful lot like the bent neck lady, and we all know how well that went. In our number nine spot today, we have Joe. Joe isn't necessarily the first name that comes to my mind when making a list of spooky demons, but this story that was posted on Reddit might just make me think a little differently. They explained that a few months ago, one of their friends brought over a Ouija board. There were around five of them at this sleepover, and they all began playing around with it and asking questions, and that is when they met Joe. After about an hour of questions and answers with Joe, one of the girls asks, Joe, are you a bad spirit? Joe answered, N-O, okay. That's good. But then Joe spelled out H-I-M. The girls asked him who he was talking about, and that's when he spelled out the words, he's coming, and started to spell out Zozo, which if you aren't familiar, is one of the worst Ouija board demons you could possibly encounter. That ended up being the end of the Ouija board experience for the girls that night, because how terrifying, but they decided in the morning to try again. This time, they began speaking to someone who apparently claimed to be Joe's wife. They asked her if Joe was a bad spirit 
to which she quickly replied, Y-E-S. In our number eight spot today, we have the dog. This story starts off with the storyteller who we'll call Alicia and her friends playing with a Ouija board in the backyard. She explains that they did end up contacting someone and this is when one of the friends who was also there decides that it would be a good idea to insult the name of this entity. I don't know about you, but I certainly would never risk it. I'm not trying to be haunted for the rest of my life and my afterlife just because I thought I was smug. Anyway, when the friend throws this insult out, the fence behind them immediately starts to rattle. This was enough to convince them that it was time to pack up and head back inside. They all headed for the door, but Alicia's dog stopped at the bottom of the stairs, which was already unusual behavior. When they turned to look at the dog, they found him standing there just snarling, looking at something that he could see out in the darkness. I'm sure hoping that the person learned not to insult people who lay on the other side. In our number 7 spot today we have Blanche. This story comes from the reddit user Turtleshell Magic and it involves their friends M and L. So one night the three of them were at M's house and decided to crack open the good old Ouija board for a little spooky fun. They contacted some sort of spirit whose name was Blanche and who lived sometime in the 1800s and everything was going well until M asked Blanche how they died and she replied with the word killing. M asked how they had been killed. And Blanche said, not I. From there, everything started to get really heavy and the room just like felt different. All of a sudden, the board was ripped from their hands and went flying across the room. They stopped playing immediately, but I don't think that they closed everything properly. After this incident, Em's mom passed away just a week after from an illness that no one knew she had. Not long after this, Ella's mom was hospitalized and then shortly after that, Turtle Shell's mom had to have emergency surgery. Maybe this was all just some horrible, horrible coincidence, but Turtle Shell says that since then they have experienced things that they think are directly related to what happened that night. Things like hearing voices, dark shadows, hearing footsteps. They find themselves wondering if they're still haunted, despite it having been nine years since that night. In our number six spot today, we have the devil. This is a story that is actually the one that caused this person to swear off Ouija boards for the rest of their life. They say the experience was so terrifying it made them completely lose interest. They explain that halfway through their session in this particular circumstance, they ended up contacting a new spirit who claimed to be the devil. I personally would like to hang up that call for sure, especially when this person explains that the spirit seemed to be annoyed that it was being disturbed. Like, so sorry, no problem, I'll go. The storyteller explains that after receiving several messages from the spirit that said, please stop and then stop, which for the record, I would have listened to the first time, but apparently they just kept going because they say that suddenly the temperature dropped just like you see in the movies. From here, the spirit gave them a message that read, if you do not stop now, I will fill the room with the most evil spirits. They definitely took that one seriously and decided it was best to stop and simply has never gone back. In our number five spot today, we have the thrifting find. One day, this Reddit user found a real old school wooden Ouija board at a thrift store. I probably would have run in the opposite direction, but they ended up purchasing it. Later that evening, they and a friend decided to try it out and asked a few questions, but never got a response. They of course got bored and left the Ouija board out on the bed and headed out of the house to go and get some snacks. This was all fine until they came back to the house. When they got back, they realized that the planchette was now moving, but completely on its own. The word foul was being spelled out over and over again, and the two just stared at it in absolute awe. Eventually, they grabbed the board, broke it in half, and covered it with salt before they got rid of it in a safe place. I definitely think that experience was probably the last time they ever ever used a Ouija board. In our number four spot today, we have Persistence. This story is from someone with a username, Amara Lachey, and they wrote, quote, my cousin was heading to a party with a Ouija board in the trunk of her car for all of us to use. On the way to the party, she got in a car wreck. She was fine, but her car was totaled. So obviously, instead of going to the party, she went back home. When she opened her closet to get ready for bed, the board was somehow back in the closet. She burned it after that. Honestly, that is the only truly good response to having something like that happen. I'm just glad she was okay and hopefully that board never came back again. In our number three spot today, we have signs. This story starts out like many of the others on this list. A group of friends just casually trying their hand at contacting the paranormal. You know, that stuff that most of us do on weekends. The friends felt as though they had contacted someone
someone, but they wanted to be sure, so they said, if you're here, give us a sign. They all stood there and nothing happened, which made them doubt the power and ability of the Ouija board. Just as they were beginning to laugh at the board, they received a sign that the entity was with them. This came in the form of lights flickering on and off for minutes at a time. It didn't stop here though. They also could hear footsteps stomping above them despite being the only ones home. Safe to say they were sufficiently spooked and apologized for ever doubting whatever entity they came into contact with. In our number two spot today, we have the following. This story starts out when this person's mother began to get interested in things like card reading and the occult, and she began trying to speak to spirits. One day she was using a Ouija board, and when the storyteller touched the planchette, it is said that it flew right out of his hand and smashed against the wall. This happened when he was a teenager, but since then, nothing has been the same. They explained that from then on, in the night, they could feel something looking at them from the darkest corner of their room, like some sort of shadowy figure. You can't really see because it's dark and it's nighttime, but you know it's there. Throughout their life, even after moving to different homes, they have seen things in the places they live that seem to be following them anywhere they go. In our number one spot today, we have I See You. This story comes from a Reddit user called No Springs. One day they were at a friend's house having fun and goofing around, and they decided to bring out a Ouija board. They weren't getting very many results and weren't really taking it seriously, but then they got a message from the board saying, I can see you through the window. And then another after that that said, I can see you through his eyes. There was a small window in the basement room they were in, and through that window they could see the backyard, the driveway, and the woods that lay behind it. They continued to ask the spirit questions and ended up getting an answer that said, I'm under the car. Somehow they were able to muster up the nerve to go and check under the car with flashlights. When they looked, they found a huge black stray cat hissing. This obviously terrified them, and they all ran back into the house as quickly as possible. At the exact moment they get back inside the house, all of the power shuts off, the lights go out, and it's completely dark. After that, it's safe to say that they stayed up all night, unable to sleep, and they definitely never played with a Ouija board again. Number 10, Maria. Ouija boards are wooden boards with planchettes that people use to try to communicate with the dead or even try to summon demons. It appears that this actually happened in 2006 at an all-girls Catholic school near Mexico City. Nearly 15% of the school started to suffer from mysterious symptoms, everything from headaches to difficulty walking that would come and go with no warning. It was determined that the cause of this was a student named Maria who had used a Ouija board to summon a demon. After finding out, she was expelled from the school. There are many reasons that certain people might try to call upon a demon, whether it be to take care of an enemy or try to become famous. So what was Maria asking for? Gotta be a good reason, right? Well, it turns out she had asked the demon to help her school win a basketball game. Definitely a good reason. Number 9. The Ammons Family LaToya Ammons lived with her three children in a small home in Indiana. While they only lived there for a year, she said that their entire life was turned upside down. The things that occurred in the home were written down in a document of interviews and police reports that was almost a thousand pages long. So just what happened? Shortly after they moved into the home in 2011, they were swarmed by flies, even in the cold winter months, and no matter what the family did, they just kept coming. One of her children apparently levitated over top of their bed, another climbed backwards up the wall, and all of them spoke in deep demonic voices. These events were witnessed and believed by both child support workers, hospital nurses, and police officers. The children were removed and received exorcisms from a reverend. After everything had been done, LaToya and her family moved away, believing to this day that her home and her children had been possessed by demons. Ghost Adventures host Zach Bagans later bought the home in 2014, but had it demolished two years later, stating, There was something there that was very dark, yet highly intelligent and powerful. Personally, I think this is just a great free advertisement for birth control. Number 8. Zozo while a seemingly cute name that a child might name their dog, Zozo is apparently a demon who often appears to communicate through Ouija boards, looking to take advantage of those who choose to play the dangerous game. This group of friends, however, had a different type of interaction when they came together to use the board. The planchette told them that they were speaking to someone named Sue, but upon asking its true name, it started spelling out Zozo over and over again. It didn't stop until one member of the group asked it to. When asked why it had listened to him, Zozo told him that he was special. 
The group member then became able to guess what the demon was going to answer, and was even correct in calling it out when they blindfolded him, saying that Zozo was speaking to him in his head. Eventually, they ended the game when Zozo started to spell out the group member's name over and over again, the demon only leaving when he specifically asked him to. But apparently the experience wasn't all scary, as they reported that the demon had quote, cracked jokes and said some funny in my opinion, a demon who cracks jokes is still a demon, and I wouldn't really like to mess with it. Number 7. Roland Doe In St. Louis, Missouri sits a home that was once the residence of a boy named Roland Doe, also known as Ronald Hunkler or Robbie Mannheim. When he was 13 years old, he became distraught over the loss of his beloved Aunt Harriet. She had apparently taught him many things, including how to use a Ouija board, because nothing bad has ever happened from using a Ouija board. He quickly started to experience strange things like scratching sounds, leaking walls, and his mattress moving. Multiple exorcisms were performed on him but seemed to fail, scratches appearing on his body including an X which they thought represented the number 10, saying that he had 10 demons inside him. As time went on, he would seem to be normal during the day, but at night would enter trance-like states, screaming and reacting violently to sacred objects. Ronald finally appeared to be cured after a final exorcism where he said he saw a vision of Saint Michael defeating Satan on a battlefield. Number 6. George Lukens in the 1770s, a tailor named George Lukens started acting strangely. He was speaking in strange voices, making inhuman noises, and would go into fits of rage out of nowhere. He stayed in a hospital for 18 months where doctors deemed him incurable, not really sure what was wrong with him. People started to gossip that he was bewitched, and George himself said that he was possessed by no less than seven different demons. Finally, in Bristol's Temple Church, seven priests oversaw his exorcism. He apparently stated that he was the devil himself, becoming more violent and singing hymns backwards. Eventually, the priests finished their ritual and demanded that the demons return back to hell, and apparently, it worked. Lukens called out, Blessed Jesus, started praising God and thanking those that had helped him. George Lukens went on with his life, after the event always being described as calm and happy. It's not often that you get a happy ending to these types of stories. Number 5. Charlie Charlie If you were in school around the same time that I was, it's likely you've heard the story of Charlie Charlie, or even gathered around a desk with your friends to try and play it yourself. The game works like this. You split a paper into four sections, two labeled with yes and two labeled with no. You then stack two pencils on top of each other and ask, Charlie, Charlie, are you there? The pencil is then supposed to move on its own to point to a yes or no answer. You can then go on to ask Charlie whatever burning questions are on your mind and it will give you an answer. The person moving the pencils is supposedly a demon who was a child named, you guessed it, Charlie. While it may seem like a simple game, there are plenty of videos and stories of teens playing the game and supposedly actually summoning Charlie, the pencils moving and seeming to bring with them an aura of unease. This is an easy enough game to try out for yourself if you want to, but I'll leave that up to you guys. Number 4. Estefania Lazaro this girl was born in South Madrid in the 1970s, and according to her parents, Estefania started playing around with the occult from a young age. Eventually, she ended up performing a seance at school in an attempt to contact one of her friend's deceased boyfriends. The ritual was interrupted by a teacher, but her friends said that they saw a strange smoke going up into her mouth and nose. Since that day, she started suffering from hallucinations and seizures, but doctors weren't able to find anything medically wrong with her. She was then found deceased in her bedroom in 1991, but there seemed to be no explanation for how she had actually died. Her parents blamed it on her connection to the occult and her usage of a Ouija board, and strange things started happening in the house afterwards. This ranged from banging noises to objects appearing to jump from shelves. It seems that she hadn't managed to contact her friend's dead lover, but instead something far more sinister. Number 3. Revenge Summoning demons isn't just a thing of the past, and many true believers still attempt to do it today. One user took to the internet to tell his story of attempting to summon the demon Malfes, who is supposedly second in command under Satan, having 40 legions of demons working under him. 
He wanted to get revenge on someone from school, and so he started a ritual. He drew a symbol on the ground in blood and swallowed salt to try and prevent getting possessed. He lit candles and supposedly had a real skull, all of which he laid out before reciting a prayer that is meant for Satan, but changing the name to Malthus. He said he then woke up face down on the floor and covered in blood, five hours apparently having passed since he first performed the ritual. He said he was terrified and could feel the presence of the demon in his room. I think he shouldn't have been so surprised. If you try and summon a demon, don't be too shocked if one shows up. Number 2. Gottlieb and Didis in the 1800s, a woman by the name of Gottlieb and Didis lived in a small village in Germany. She was very religious growing up, and when her parents died at a young age, she lived with her siblings, continuing to attend services. However, strange things started to happen to her. She said that her house was haunted and she would often go into trance-like states. She said she was being visited in the night by the ghost of a woman holding a baby in her arms. She thought that evil spirits had been after her since she was a baby and her mother had been keeping them away. She also said her aunt was a witch, who may have been responsible for the evil spirits and demons. Eventually, it was determined that she had been possessed, and she underwent an exorcism that lasted two whole years. The reverend reported her throwing up glass, nails, and blood, and she apparently became very physically violent. The demons were eventually finally removed by the reverend, and he became like a celebrity for managing to complete the rituals. Number 1. Under the Bed Six years ago, one person told the story of how they think they may have accidentally summoned a demon in their youth. From a young age, they had been obsessed with dark and creepy things and had decided to make themselves a creepy doll. Because hey, who wouldn't? But when sewing it closed, they pricked their finger, trapping some of their blood inside the doll. From then on, they always felt like they were being watched, and even said they would hear raspy breathing at night. They felt they knew there was a spirit with them and asked its name, and it replied in the same raspy voice saying, Adam. They also recalled a time when they had sensed a presence in their room and looked under their bed to see a face, looking at them obscured in the dark. Even when they moved houses, they left the doll behind, but it suddenly appeared in a drawer in their new home. More things would continue to happen for years, like objects disappearing or sounds from empty rooms. Eventually, they had a friend come over to visit who became panicked when apparently hearing the raspy voice repeating its name. When they left, all the strange occurrences stopped happening, and they believed that the demon had attached itself to their friend and left. I don't know about you guys, but if one of my friends stuck a demon to me, I don't think I'd ever talk to them again. Number 10, Codex Gigas. Right off the hop, this book is said to give the reader the ability to harness evil and negative energy, and it's often referred to as the Devil's Bible. Already into it, here we go folks. The book was first discovered in 1648 during the Thirty Years' War. The Swedish army looted Prague and amongst the hall was the Codex Gigas. Yeah, hard to miss this one. 36 inches tall, 20 inches wide, and 8.7 inches thick, coming in at 156 pounds. Yeah, it's a little thicker than Bernstein Bears. You're not gonna miss it. It's said that this book was actually written by a monk, but said monk had broken his spiritual vows. He was of course punished, but in a pretty extreme way, which is said to be sealed behind a wall and then left there for eternity to die. Just behind a wall forever. Right before his passing though, he realized he wouldn't be able to finish said book, which is then when he summoned Lucifer and asked him to complete the book for him because he was busy, you know, behind a wall and stuff. Yeah, like unemployed professors back then. The devil's like, eh, I'll do that essay for you. No sweat, take a five, brother. Sell your soul, I got you. I'll script it. This book is filled with dark rituals, instructions on how to perform exorcisms, as well as a bunch of creepy drawings of the devil and other demons, just, just for fun. Right now it's said that the book has 310 pages, but that once used to be 320. Those 10 pages that were ripped out were said to contain instructions on how someone could summon the devil. So hopefully whoever has those pages, Burn them, or I don't know, made a nice birthday card with them. That'd be fun. Number nine, the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the mage. A little wordy in my opinion, but it's also a pretty good book. This book was of course created by Abramelin, who was in the title, who was indeed a mage, and he created this book as a gift for his son. Yeah, Lego wasn't a thing yet, and neither was fun, so he got him a magical book. Thanks, Dad. In the early 1900s, this book was translated into English, and that's when the rumors of the book being cursed began to spread, of course. I mean, this book contains spells, but also contains curses, so I feel like that rumor 
it checks out, you know, people are talking for a reason. Abbott Mellon believed that everybody had their own personal demon. The good thing about this book, however, is that it holds instructions on how to get your demons under control through rituals and spiritual situations. The kicker is, is that it's always risky to reach out to the spiritual world, so it's, it's really not worth it, right? That's why everybody thinks this book is so cursed. Unless you absolutely know what you're doing, the contents of this book might just be too powerful for you, my friend. Those who have had bad experiences with the book explain either bad luck or hauntings from the spiritual world are awaiting for those who read it. So yeah, stick with Arthur or Bernstein Bears, really keep it cool. Number eight, the book of black magic and pacts. At first I thought this said black magic and pets and I got really excited for a hot moment. This book written by A.E. Waits is a guide on all things occult. It looks at lore, magic, occultist history, and of course ceremonies. There's certainly no issue with all this in itself in a book, but when this book is in the wrong hands, things can get a little dicey, especially considering this book has been referred to as one of the greatest overviews of occultism and it includes a large number of magical spells from a variety of sources. Yeah, they all have spells in them. They're all like Harry Potter. They're all like the Chamber of Secrets, that book that he stabs with a tooth. They're all like that, they're all bad. The author of this book, A.E. Wade is said to have been a British scholarly mystic as well as a poet, and it's said that he was quite a prolific writer on both the occult and esoteric matters. Nice, but he was an occult or two, but he was great with a pen. Number seven, the Munich Manual. Also referred to as the Necromancer's Manual, that's always fun, this grimoire comes to us from the 15th century and is a text that is largely focused on demonology and necromancy. Two things you want in a book. A lot of grimoires have both good and black magic, but this is one that focuses solely on the dark, bad side. Know what I mean? Just in case you're a very specific demon, this book is for you. You won't believe number four. Dive in, here you go. There are three different sections to this one. First section deals with the illusionist magic and spells that trick people into seeing things that aren't there. The next one is psychological magic, which is meant to use emotions, politics, and things like that in order to gain power over an individual. And if these two weren't scary enough, the third section is the divinatory spells which is meant to allow the reader to see into the past, present, or future. Imagine seeing into the present. What a waste that would be. You're just looking in a cauldron like, hey, that's me looking into the cauldron right now. It's like the game Portal. You're like, oh my God, it's crazy. It's so trippy. All sections are bad news in this book, but one of the most popular parts of said book is the part that includes instructions on how to make the Mirror of Lilith. We have our own Mirror of Lilith right here. I look into it every day. No spoilers, I'm only on season 27 of life. Please don't tell me how I'm gonna pass, thanks. Number six, The Orphan Story. This book was originally written in the early 1600s, but it didn't end up getting published until 2018, cause you know, things take a while sometimes. We were a bit busy. The Orphan Story is about a 14 year old Spanish boy who heads to the Americas, you know, a classic coming of age tale, a feel good story, dare I say, until it isn't anymore. This is exactly the reason why it took so long for said book to be published. While the curse in this book doesn't come from the story itself, there's something that happens, there's something dark lurking in those pages, and people end up taking their own lives. It's horrible. The book's publisher, Belinda Palacios, who worked on the book for two years, explained that throughout those years, she was often warned of the cursed book and how every publisher who had tried to work on it before ended up passing away in a mysterious, tragic kind of way before they could finish the book. You know what I mean? Some Final Destination stuff would kind of happen here. Her research showed that those who tried to edit the book before either found themselves in horrible accidents or with strange illnesses, right? One of the two. Luckily, Belinda made it through the process unscathed for now, so let's just hope that maybe the curse has been lifted. Either way, I can't read, so I'm not gonna get there anytime soon. Number five, The Grand Grimoire. This book is often referred to as the book with incredible powers, and it's been called one of the darkest books in the world, right next to Holes. Those two are tied right now. While the author of this book is still unknown, classic, the contents of it are things like black magic, dark spooky secrets, occult information, anything I just talked about, more of that. It's believed that the book was written sometime around 1521 and it's split into two books. Yeah, classic. He's like, ah, but wait, there's more. Tune in next week, $15, give me it right now. Book one details instructions on how to summon a demon and how to get the demon to do your bidding, do your house chores, whatever you want. Maybe even answer some phone calls, sure. The second book is split into two parts and it details how to make a pact with a demon and how to command the spirit, but with less tools, which means that it's significantly more riskier than the first book. They're like, hey, you can do this, but it's gonna cost you. Come to this book. People fear the grand grimoire because they worry that if anyone reads it fully, then the devil will then enslave their soul. Okay, you said it, return to that one. Next, number four, the Book of Soiga. Anything that is referred to as the Book of Death, 
Ho ho, count me in. I'll renew my library card right now. Let's do it, let's amp it up. The Book of Soiga, this one's tough because nobody knows what language it's written in, right? So that's obviously a challenge. The beginning part of the book definitely contains some spells or incantations, and the ending of the book is really where the most mystery lies. And trying to decipher it is not that easy. It's said that a scholar called John Dee once attempted to decode the secret book, and it was so difficult that he needed to call on an angel, the angel Uriel, for help. Everyone's calling demons and angels for help. I'm like, can I do that? If I call in sick one day, can I call a demon? Is that, I don't know if we could do that. Even the angel didn't have the answers on this part and he instructed John to call on the archangel, Michael, who would be the only one who was really able to interpret said text. After John D passed away in 1608, the book basically just vanished. No one knows where it went, but then, like magic, it just reappeared again in the 19th century. Despite this extremely interesting story and how it kind of draws you in, whoever is said to read the book will die two and a half years later. So, is it worth it? Do we want to have two years left of our life for a book? If it's Avatar 2 and they're like, hey, you have two years to live after you see Avatar 2, I'd be like, okay, maybe, maybe. But this book, I'm like, nah, none of that, I'm good. Number three, the Picatrix. This is a grimoire that is said to contain a large amount of magic that is presumed to be from the 11th century. The pages contain some philosophy, some astrology, some medieval science, stuff like that. And then there are things like recipes that involve mixing human and or animal blood. So it's, it's one of those. Not so fun, and yeah, it's not so fun. Not a lot of pictures to color in, you know? The results are said to be magical, magical, of course, but in reality, it's just a book on mixing horrible things together, like illicit substances and urine. Mix them together, put them in a cauldron. I'm like, no, how about that? Number two, Sorrows of Young Werther. This is a book that came out in 1774 and it's said to have a large and negative impact on its readers right since its release. The book will summon your own inner demon, apparently. Right after this book came out, a huge wave of its readers ended up taking their own lives because of the strange and dark influence that this book had on those who read it. Young men would start trying to emulate the main character of the book by dressing like him, acting like him, that sort of thing. Not really shocking here. But the book ultimately left to horrifying actions. So in real life, these guys would also take their own lives. It was horrible. This actually led to the book being banned in some countries because, well, it's not worth the risk. See, things like this make me curious, of course, but I don't think I'd ever want to read something that depressing anyways, you know what I mean? Number one, the Lesser Key of Solomon. This one is said to contain spells that are used for summoning over 72 different demons. And just to spice it up a little bit to this day, no one is exactly sure who wrote it. Yeah, still anonymous back there, penning it up. Could have been one of the 72 demons, who knows? The Lesser Key of Solomon is made up of a few different texts from somewhere around the 17th century. This book is said to be cursed, so even having a copy of it will cause the owner to experience constant bad luck or have the worst luck of all by, you know, passing away, biting the bullet. One person shared that the book violently just flew itself across the room at them, just like Interstellar. We just got a haunted bookshelf now to take care of. All because you bought a weird book at a garage sale, know what I mean? While we aren't sure who wrote it, there are rumors or stories that suggest that it might have been King Solomon. It is said that perhaps he wrote it for his son and then asked him to bury it with him in his grave. When being prepared for burial, a group of Babylonian philosophers found said book, and this is when they were visited by an angel who told them to hide the book from the unworthy. Yeah, only the worthy can read this one. They then placed a spell on the book, which is meant to keep it away from getting into the wrong hands, and it's said to be how the book got its curse in the first place, so. If a friend lets you borrow Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, just ask them. Ask if it's cursed before, you know? Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Belphegor. Belphegor is a fallen angel, and after his fall from heaven, he has now become the demon lord, presiding over the sin of sloth. It is said that, as Belphegor served as a lieutenant from hell, he was sent to earth on a mission by Satan. While he was on earth, he grew quite fond of Paris, France, and it is said that because of this affinity, he now lurks deep within the catacombs under the city. Belphegor can be invoked by mortals who are wishing to find fame and wealth, usually through through as little effort as possible. But these wishes are of course doomed to fail because of the demon's true mission to lure the dreamers into sloth. Through the failure of whatever was provided to the dreamer by Belphegor, he then draws them into procrastination and idle dreaming rather than active production, which then condemns them to a life of failure. Belphegor is also recognized as one of the seven great kings who rule over hell. In our number nine spot today, we have Burstook. Burstook is a Wendish evil god of the forest and is known for his 
trickery. He is often described as being half man and half goat, but there are some sources which claim he is actually all shadow and doesn't even have a human form at all and instead is more a spirit of the woods. So here's what dark thing he's got going on. He likes to trick wanderers of the forest into getting lost. Yep, literally just a full on nightmare. He hangs out in the dark depths of the forest waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Once a wanderer stumbles across his path, he'll play tricks where he changes the path in the woods or he'll whisper in their ears to frighten them and he'll lay branches in their way so that they'll trip and fall. And he does this all simply because he just enjoys the suffering of others. Sounds pretty evil to me. In our number 8 spot today we have Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a former seraph who turned into a high ranking demon. He is one of the princes of hell and also oversees the order of the fly. He, Satan and Lucifer form the triarchy of hell which makes him one of the supreme monarchs of the underworld. As a seraphim he was under the archangel Gabriel but he was one of the very first angels to fall. He is often confused with Satan and while the two names can technically be interchanged, they are two separate entities and in some writings they even disagree at times. He is associated with pride and gluttony and he has also been held responsible for demonic possessions throughout the years. Unfortunately, flies are a very important thing for him as it is said that he can take the form of flies. Now his main job is to rule over the fallen angels as well as the demons that are originally from hell. In our number 7 spot today we have Lilith. Lilith is a demon goddess who appears a lot in mythology. Her dark origins start in Sumerian and Babylonian demonology and she is the picture of the beautiful maiden with a dark spirit. Legend says once she chose a lover she would never let him go and would give nothing in return. Some people believe that Lilith was actually the first wife of Adam and that the two were created equal but Adam didn't like that she wasn't obedient to him so he abandoned her and this is when God made Eve. This is what is rumored to have turned Lilith into a snake which then tempted Eve into the apple. After Adam and Eve were then banished from the Garden of Eden, Lilith turned into a demon goddess and vowed to get her revenge on all men. In our number 6 spot today we have Baal. Baal is ranked as the first of the Ars Gotia which I had to look up because I am not really familiar with a lot of demons and demonology works. If you're like me and aren't exactly up to date on this, as explained by the demonic paradise fandom.com Quote, the Ars Gotia, also known as the 72 Pillars, is a group comprised of 72 demons with exemplary strength and their own legions. They are listed in the Grimoire Lesser Key of Solomon. Okay. Cool. So Baal is the first on that list and he is the principal king of hell. It is said that he governs somewhere from 66 to 250 legions of demons and spirits, so he's clearly a workaholic. In grimoire tradition, it is said that Baal appears in the form of a man, a cat, a toad, or different combinations of those with the appearance of a king or soldier, but with the heads of these creatures, and on a set of spider legs. So I'm just saying, the guy's not easy to miss. I feel like it's Pretty clear. In our number 5 spot today we have Asmodeus. Asmodeus is the king of demon and earthly spirits and is referred to as one of the seven princes of hell. He also represents one of the seven deadly sins, lust. Before becoming a demon in his former life he was an angel who was known as Asmodel, the angel of April and patience who rules the zodiac sign Taurus. But of course we are here to talk about his demon form which is said to appear either as a ruthless brutal monster or as a kind of mischievous demon that is playful and quick thinking. Honestly, I'm not sure which form would be worse to encounter. The monster would be scary, but a little annoying demon would also be the worst. For the most terrifying exit I've ever heard of, it is said that Asmodeus will cut himself into pieces and immediately after disappear. In our number 4 spot today we have Azazel. Azazel is one of the chief governors of the Grigori which is a group of fallen angels who married female mortals which then produced the Nephilim which are these scary giant creatures that ate mortals. In the beginning Azazel started as an eater of sins but the more sins he consumed the hungrier he became and this led to him not being satiated by the sins he was receiving. The reason he was cast from heaven is because he taught men how to make swords, knives, shields and breastplates which then led to humans being corrupted and thinking that they were invincible. It is said that the humans went so far that they were planning to raid heaven and this is when God told Raphael to bind Azazel's hands and feet, open up a hole in the desert and toss him in, casting him into darkness. This worked and for a long time Azazel remained in prison. It was so bad that the jagged rocks near him tore his physical body away and this left him as a mass of darkness covered in mouths and eyes. Later freed by Lucifer he went on to join the demon 
remains in hell. In our number three spot today, we have Eamon. It's weird, she used to work here. <laughs> Different, different Amen. Amen is the great Marquis of Hell, and he is the seventh of the demons in the Ars Gotia. It is said that he is in charge of governing 40 different legions of demons, but his favorite thing to do with humans is making them fall in love with each other. He is also known to settle debates. And you might be sitting there thinking that this guy actually sounds pretty cool and nice, but despite all of these cool and nice things he enjoys, he is anything but nice. Just like he can make people fall in love, he can also do the exact opposite as well. He can cause people to turn against each other and can even will someone to harm the innocent, which is just terrifying. To make that thought slightly less horrifying, it is said that he usually doesn't do this for no reason, and it tends to only happen when he is attacked or if someone is standing in his way of completing a mission. Still not good, but I suppose that's better than just random acts of violence. It is said that Eamon appears as a wolf with a snake's tail and that he possesses the ability to breathe fire. Or he might appear as a man with dog teeth who is inside of a raven. I don't know. Ask him about that, not me. In our number two spot today, we have Hades. We are not talking about the Unreal game, instead we are talking about the dad that you gotta fight in it. Hades is the king of the underworld and the god of the dead, and I'm not sure if it gets any darker than that. It was believed that just by speaking his name, he would have the power to bring you to the underworld, so people tried to avoid his name like it was Voldemort. Hades was sure to never let any souls that entered the underworld escape, and he would punish anyone who tried, or anyone who tried to save someone in the underworld. One of his darkest myths is in reference to the time he kidnapped Persephone. He opened up the earth where she was picking flowers, and he kept her in the underworld. Persephone's mother, Demeter, was of course really unhappy about this and did everything she could to get her back. Hades finally agreed to let her go, but of course there's always a twist with these guys. He gives her a pomegranate seed as a parting gift, which she eats. Little does she know, if you eat food from the underworld, it binds you to it. So now she is bound to Hades, and basically the story ends off with her being allowed to live a few months of the year on Earth, but the rest of the time she's stuck in the underworld. So yeah, Hades is just out there kidnapping people. Really uncool. In our number one spot today, we have Lamashtu. Lamashtu is a demon, monster, malevolent goddess, or demigoddess who comes from Mesopotamian mythology, and she certainly is terrible. Her name means she who erases, and this is because she would prey on women during childbirth and wait for them to be breastfeeding their new baby so she could kidnap newborn and eat its flesh. I honestly don't know if it gets any darker than that. She was also known to disturb sleep and cause nightmares, as one of her less worse qualities is that she would also be known to harm the environment, bound the muscle of men, and would bring sickness and disease. Mothers who were expecting children would wear an amulet that depicted her in order to protect their pregnancy from her. Sometimes people would even leave offerings to keep her appeased, which would always be small, feminine objects. There are some cultures where Lamashtu was regarded as a guardian but I'm sure they didn't hear the whole eating babies thing or else I feel like they might have changed their minds. Mm -hmm. 